We have an Earth-directed solar storm on its way, and big flare risk remains high because we have some new regions rotating into Earth view. Those stories and more are in this week's Spotlight. If you want to learn how weather from our star causes impacts at the Earth that shape the future of our world, join professors Dr. Jenny Meehan, Michael Cook, and myself as we guide you through a space weather certificate program like no other. To enroll in the space weather and environment science program offered at Millersville University, go to millersville.edu slash swen. It's weather for the 21st century. This forecast also sponsored in part by CW Ops. Space weather over the past couple weeks has been pretty busy and this week is no exception. As we take a look at our Earth-facing disk, we're finally saying goodbye to region 3777, which was part of why we had that big G4 level solar storm back on the 12th. But we've also been paying attention to region 3780. This region has also been firing a few big solar flares, but not any real Earth-directed solar storms, at least not of yet. We have been watching a bit of activity moving off to the southwest, but nothing that's Earth-directed. Meanwhile, we've been paying close attention to this region. This is a big coronal hole that's going to be rotating in through the Earth strike zone over the next couple days. It's going to send us a pocket of fast solar wind, but it's not expected to be all that strong. Could possibly give us a little bit of a roar at high latitudes, but we're really not expecting all that much. Really, the big story is region 3784. Over the past 24 hours or so, this region has actually gotten very active. It's popped a few big solar flares. And then early on the 14th, pow, right there, it fires off a big X-class flare. This was an X 1.1 class flare with an R3 level radio blackout. You can see it all over Asia here. On top of that, it also launched an Earth-directed solar storm. You can see that right here in this halo. Do you see this very slight signature here to the northeast? That is an Earth-directed solar storm. This junk here off to the side is actually a, a solar storm that's going west of Earth. So this is kind of sandwiched in a bunch of other junk. But this solar storm is definitely Earth-directed. Now, as we take a look at that, we might think that this thing is going to go northeast of Earth. But because of this coronal hole above it and the fast solar wind up here, that could actually deflect that solar storm back down into the Earth's sun line. So it might actually be a bigger hit than what the models are going to say, but we'll talk more about that in a minute. Meanwhile, as we move to the east limb, take a look at this region. Pow! Right there. Did you see that? That was an M5.5 class flare from a region that hasn't even fully rotated into Earth view yet. It's likely going to be named region 3790, but this region is a big flare player, and it's also launching big solar storms, so expect that more chances for big R3 level radio blackouts as well as big Earth-directed solar storms are in our future. And now switching to our full sun map, we have SDO AIA imagery that's here on the front side of the sun. Uh, that's in red, and we are lucky enough to have Solar Orbiter on the Sun's far side and EUI imagery that of the Sun's far side so we can actually see what might be lurking there. Now, we have you can see region 3777, 3780. That should be getting you oriented. You'll also see region 3784 uh, kind of emerging here. This is to kind of give you an idea of what's on the front side right now. But as we look to the sun's west limb and beyond the west limb to the sun's far side, there's some very interesting developments you might want to be paying attention to. First of all, take a look at right here in between region 37, 68 and 62. You're going to watch new region growth right here. That is going to be a very interesting configuration. Uh, it oftentimes is a big flare spawner and big solar storm spawners because this becomes very unstable when you get new regions emerging between two other ones. So we're going to be paying close attention to that. We also have some new activity here as well as here. Now, interestingly enough, as we continue moving this forward, you notice that this, sure enough, ends up being the region that is beginning to rotate into Earth view now. This is the one that fired that big M5.5 
five flare that's occulted. So this is why I say we're going to have some big solar flare activity rotating into view here over the next couple, couple days. We're also going to very soon have big chances for more Earth-directed solar storms. So amateur radio operators, emergency responders, and aurora photographers, pay close attention to that east limb because new activity is surely around the corner. And now switching back to that solar storm that is on its way to Earth, we take a look at our solar storm prediction model, Enlil. Now this is NOAA's version of the model, the top panel's density, the bottom panel's velocity, and you're looking down at the sun from the North Pole with Earth being off to the right. Now as we set this, uh, this model in motion, you're going to see that solar storm being launched here in just a moment. That solar storm is moving reasonably slowly, even though it's actually a direct hit for Earth. We're not expecting the impact to be extremely quick. In fact, NOAA is expecting the impact to be early on the 18th, and it's going to be a decent impact. But again, if it's not moving all that fast, it couldn't bump us up to really strong storm levels. So we're not expecting all that much from this. Of course, the storm could arrive a little bit earlier. If so, we could see aurora dip down uh, to mid latitudes, but likely we're not going to see all that much from this solar storm. In fact, as we take a look at our NASA's version of the model, and again, you're looking down at the sun from the North Pole with Earth being off to the right. If I set this solar storm model in motion, you're going to see that solar storm being launched. In NASA's version, it is actually a little bit faster than what you saw with NOAA's version, NASA actually has the storm hitting Earth about midday on the 17th. If that is the case, then this solar storm will pack a bit more of a punch. We could see storm levels, maybe G1 levels, uh, and we could see a decent aurora down at mid-latitude. So it all depends upon how fast that solar storm is actually going to hit Earth. If it arrives on the early side, we could get more aurora. If it arrives on the late side, well, it may be just left to aurora photographers at high latitudes. And now switching to our moon, we are passing through the first quarter phase on our way to a full moon, with the full moon being on the 19th. So you night sky watchers, if you want to catch those dim objects in the sky, like, I don't know, maybe some aurora, you're going to have this bright companion. So you're going to need to check your local rise and set times. Now, switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are anticipating the hit from that Earth-directed solar storm, but we're not expecting all that much activity from it. In fact, we do even have a little bit of fast solar wind that's going to be preceding that. So at high latitudes, expect to be on a wind watch starting around the 16th, but by the 17th, we could be active to possibly minor storm conditions. In fact, we have about a 25% chance of a major storm starting around late on the 17th into the 18th. Now at mid-latitudes, the story is a little bit quieter. We are still on a wind watch for the 16th, but not expecting to see all that much. Maybe if you're lucky, you could get a little brightening here and there. But by the 17th, we could see active conditions. In fact, we have about a 30% chance of a minor storm as we move from the 17th into the 18th. So aurora photographers, if you're dedicated, you should chase but it could be fleeting shows for you. And then by the 19th, things should be settling back down again to quiet conditions. But remember, we have those new regions rotating into Earth view, and they look like they could send us some solar storms soon. And now switching to our solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week, we are sitting well in the 200s. We're sitting around 250, 260 this week for solar flux. This means radio propagation on Earth's dayside would be really good if it weren't for the big risk for radio blackouts this week. Uh, NOAA is giving us about a 75% chance of M-class flares at the R1 to R2 level radio blackout and about a 25% chance of X-class flares at the R3 level radio blackout. And I'm going to extend this throughout the entire five day because of that new set of regions that's going to be rotating into Earth view. So amateur radio operators and emergency responders, I know you're hating life on the dayside radio bands right now. It's incredibly noisy out there, but just hang in there and expect that Radio blackouts are going to be intermittently part of just what's on the menu this week and likely next week as well before things have a chance to settle down. 
And now switching to our radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over the coming week. We are in the green this week. We don't have any big radiation storms. We're sitting at the D1 normal range. This is at flight level 360 for you aviators. It's also the S0 quiet range for everyone else. However, we do have about a 15% chance of radiation storms right now. And this is because we've got a couple big flare players rotating to the sun's west limb. That will stay elevated for the next couple days and then it will slowly taper off a little bit. We might get down to about, I don't know, 10%, maybe. If I doubt we'll get as low as 5%, but we'll see. Meanwhile, it does look like we're going to stay in the green when it comes to radiation storms. So uh, all of you frequent flyers, and this does include air crew, although you should check those ICAO advisories often for updated information. Right now, it looks like you're all in the clear. So the space weather this week is keeping us on our toes. We do have an Earth-directed solar storm that's on its way. It's not a super fast moving storm, but it could get a little bit of a push from some fast solar wind that's going to kind of keep it down in that Earth-Sun line. So Aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, starting late on the 16th, you might start looking at the skies for the, that maybe a bit of a roar from that fast solar wind. But then that storm should hit sometime maybe late on the 17th, hopefully earlier on the 17th, so you can get some decent aurora, and that could last through the 18th. Now, if you're at mid-latitudes, well, only if you're dedicated should you chase, because you could get a chance from some sporadic aurora, especially if that solar storm is faster than the models predict it will be. Now, amateur radio operators and emergency responders, we have some new big players rotating into Earth view. They've already been firing R2-level radio blackouts, and they're not even fully in view yet. So expect those big radio blackouts to continue to be on the menu. We could also get some big solar storms launching here soon. So the dayside radio bands are going to be a bit of a mess uh, through this week and possibly through next week as well. Just hang in there. And now you GPS users, well, you know, we do have that solar storm hitting Earth, which could impact uh, your, re your re GPS reception on Earth's night side, especially anywhere near Aurora. And of course, on the day side, especially near dawn and dusk, you could have some reception issues due to those big radio blackouts, so just stay vigilant, and when that storm hits, be sure to calibrate your magnetometers often. I'm Tam with the Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching.